This is a recording from the BC Humanist Association's July 30th online event, Dehumanization and the Blackmail Forum. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and to subscribe to this podcast. Thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Emily Fagan and I'm uh, the marketing coordinator for the BC Humanist Association. I'm just going to say a few quick words before I turn things over to our speaker, Corey Clay. Um, it was great to see so much interest in Corey's first talk last month and even more in, the, in this follow-up event. Um, thank you so much for RSVPing in advance. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wissanic peoples, whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on this shared territory, although I was not invited to do so. Uh, I believe Corey is coming in to, with us tonight from Bellingham, which is on the traditional land of the Dumash people. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Given the turnout tonight, um, everyone has been muted on Zoom to prevent any inadvertent interruptions. Feel free to use the chat function to ask questions, particularly during the 30 minute Q&A at the end of this, um, which I'll try to bring up at the end again, uh, but obviously be respectful of one another and of our speaker. This talk tonight is being live streamed to our Facebook page and our executive director, Ian, will also be watching for questions and comments there. We're also recording this talk and it will be released on our YouTube channel later in the week. Um, tonight's talk is entitled Dehumanization and the Black Male Form. Humanism is a worldview that in its core is about promoting human dignity and equality. The recent wave of protests against systemic racism in the US, Canada, and around the world highlight just how far we have to go as our society, as a society to realize these values. Just like our partners at Humanist International, the American Humanist Association and Humanist UK, <clears throat> that the BC Humanist Association believes that Black Lives Matter. Humanists, including our own honorary member, Claire Colleen, have fought for prison reform and abolition in response to the often inhumane conditions she witnessed. Uh, the BCHA is a charitable organization and is able to do its work through the generosity of our members. Today, we are launching our summer fund drive, which is important for allowing us to fund more projects for the community, including a fall speaker series. If you enjoyed tonight's event and want to see more programming throughout the fall, please consider making a donation at bchumanist.ca slash summer 2020. Starting soon, we'll be offering exclusive events on online content for our members. Our next special virtual event, Evidence in Action, How Governments Find and Use Science in Policymaking, hosted by Dr. Kimberly Gerling, is coming on August 13th. This live event will be exclusive to our members and you can join our membership program for as low as $10 a year on our website. Keep an eye out for our, on our newsletter and on social media for information on how to RSVP, RSVP to that soon. Our speaker tonight, Corey Clay, has had 14 years of experience in various, various academic settings, including as an adjunct professor at private universities in Portland, Oregon, and Houston, Texas. His academic interests have included police violence, probation, and the criminalization of cannabis, as well as the dehumanization of the black male form by police and other entities. He has been involved with black non-believers and is in the process of moving to Vancouver, a situation that's been made somewhat more difficult by COVID-19 and the closure of the US border. We'll leave some time at the end for questions, but for now, Corey, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Emily uh, and Ian. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate the feedback as well. Um, and like I said, I, I look forward to having this discussion. Uh, so thank you. Thank all of you who are interested in seeing me. I really appreciate it. Um, and I look forward to answering some questions at the end. Uh, but let me just sort of get right into it. Um, I've been teaching, uh, pretty much I teach the subjects of criminology, uh, sociology, and, and, and a bit of psychology, because uh, that's my background. I have a couple of master's degrees. Um, but I've been teaching for several years. And, and I, I think the core concept when you teach criminology is that it comes down to uh, dehumanization. Uh, so, as I stated, I'm not going to sugarcoat this conversation. There is one unique form, I think globally, uh, that receives a lot of hatred, 
uh, a vast majority of hatred. That's the blackmail form. Uh, and I'm not saying that to basically take away from any other group. Uh, we'll, we're going to discuss, uh, you know, anti-Semitism today. We'll talk about indigenous people. But if you look at the blackmail form, uh, if you look at what happened to George Floyd, uh, there's something unique about being in this frame. Uh, I'm educated. I'm a fairly nice guy. I love my graphic novels. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a human being. Uh, but we're going to discuss today how I've had to sort of humanize myself uh, in different situations around different groups of people. So uh, we will discuss um, other topics, but that's the, the crux of this conversation. Uh, if you look at the criminal justice system, especially in a, a Western perspective and especially United States perspective, um, and we're not going to get too far in the weeds because we discussed this at the last talk, but uh, slavery was insidious and it really had an effect on the black male form. And if you are affecting black males in a certain way, then that trickles down to, of course, the black female and, of course, the black family. So when you dehumanize one certain thing so much, uh, what happened to George Floyd seems almost um, commonplace. And I think that's what you see now, a lot of the pushback is that it's not normal to sort of dehumanize an entity in the way that we've been dehumanized. So um, I have a couple slides, um, got about 12 slides, and they're pretty much just going to open up and remind me where to go as far as uh, my talking points because I am a massive stream of consciousness. Uh, so we won't really go into slavery, but we will discuss uh, lynching. And bear in mind, I'm looking at this pretty much in a United States perspective, uh, but lynching all the way up into 1968 was sadly a form of entertainment. Um, uh, the practice did exist before slavery. You saw a lot of places such as uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, towns in Florida, Harlem, uh, parts of Chicago, Compton, Vanport in Oregon, parts of Seattle, where Black people were actually thriving and doing well. We spoke about um, uh, Tulsa last time, so I won't get into it too much, but basically you had a, a part of Tulsa, Oklahoma that was known as Black Wall Street. Um, and so they were so prominent there. These people, these black people were making so much money and doing so well. And they were doing this without the assistance of white people, that white people burned it down uh, and took that away from them. And so you, you've seen sort of systemic ways to where even when, you know, we're told X, Y, and Z, you're unintelligent, you're a brute, et cetera, et cetera. So we figure out a way to be successful. It is still taken away from us. And that's you know, a, a lot of what happens when you dehumanize one particular thing. Uh, newspapers would print, um, you know, lynchings. You know, they would have picnics underneath the bodies. You'd have smiling crowds. You'd have postcards when you would basically lynch uh, a black body. And, and let's understand, lynching was done because it was painful. They would tie a noose around your neck, uh, throw the other end over a tree, and then you would pretty much uh, asphyxiate. Uh, and it, it's not a painful way uh, to, it, it's not a pleasant way to die. It's very painful. I've heard, uh, I've read stories about how people were uh, lynched and, you know, they left the body there and their bodies and they would come down from the tree, the tree would branch and they would, you know, it, it's, it's a horrible way to die. But it was used as a power move because certain groups of people could do that to other people, um, especially in the South. Uh, now, lynching was happening in California, lynching was happening in Oregon, it was happening everywhere in America, but predominantly it was happening in the South. Um, 500 blacks were lynched from the 1800s to 1955. Uh, I think that number is, is light, but I think that's the number that we have on file uh, because they took records of this stuff. Uh, but the primary victims of lynching were black men. Many times a black man was accused of uh, whistling, at a, at a white woman or looking at a white woman. There was this concept where you had to protect uh, white womanhood. And so we'll get into that a little bit later on, but let's just understand that lynching was a form of entertainment. So when you're using uh, a black body to entertain you, and let's understand they would also lynch the body, but then afterwards they would go over, they would lynch it. Like with Emmett Till, they would, you know, they, they killed, they shot him, then they burned him. He's dead, but they're trying to prove a point. Uh, dehumanization is one of the eight 
forms of moral disengagement. Uh, if you look at uh, the eight forms, if you want to research that with Albert Bandura. Um, and, and what Emily said, as far as humanism, when we define dehumanization, it involves redefining the targets of prejudice and violence by making them seem less human, uh, less civilized, less sentient. Um, they use terms like animal, vermin, refer to people as illegal, illegal alien, uh, a big term that they're using here in the States right now. Um, I'm, I played football in high school. Um, I'm not a, a, a football, and I mean NFL or CFL football. Um, but I watched the draft a couple years ago and I was watching the language that they were using to describe uh, primarily the young black men who were getting drafted. Uh, stud. Uh, a stud is a horse. Hoss. Hoss is another term for horse. Um, they were used these dehumanizing terms to describe these black bodies. Of course, thug is one that is used, uh, demonic. If you look at the case of Michael Brown, uh, the officer that shot him said he was, a, he was demonic. Well, I don't know how to look demonic because I don't believe in demons. Um, so yeah, also we need to look at this, uh, this, this other concept of the magical Negro concept. Um, and if you've never heard that concept, let me see if this link will open up real quick. Um, uh, this article came out in Slate about six years ago, and I won't get too far into the weeds, but uh, they did research uh, uh, how whites see blacks as superhuman. Uh, and if you look at just you know those, some of the questions that were asked um, in this um, study that was put out. Um, Keeps, okay, uh, which person is more likely to have superhuman skin that is thick enough that it can withstand the, the pain of burning coals? Uh, which person is capable of using their supernatural powers to suppress hunger and thirst? Even that, I can see how someone can see that as a positive, but I'm still a man who gets thirsty. <laughs> you know, I'm not. Uh, which person has superhuman uh, supernatural quickness that can make them capable of running faster than the fighter jet? Uh, the fact that that is sort of seen as a positive, but there's this magical Negro trope to where we can't, we can't um, have pain. Uh, we, we can't have, you know, emotions. Uh, my sister, I think she's here. My sister has a PhD in uh, community health. Uh, she described, she told me the other day that, um, you know, the way that the cops treat the black male form, that's the way black females see doctors because they don't give black females pain medication. Uh, or they don't give them pain medication when they're going through labor because it was in the textbooks how black women uh, can can withstand more pain. And that concept is also quite dehumanizing. It, it takes away the fact that, yes, if you shoot me, I'm going to more than likely die. But the fact that some people have this pathology that I am, you know, my skin is a weapon. You know, I have to shoot him because he's superhumanly strong that that's that's it's 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 a weird pathology but it's um something i've seen uh especially when i worked in law enforcement um let's go about let's go uh, talk about what is unique about the black male um two points i have to mention the positive behaviors towards black males are predicated by racial contact what that means is if you don't really deal with people of color or or black males I have to sort of ingratiate myself to you. I have to find a way to sort of normalize myself to you. you know, he, he speaks so well. He's, the, the, the term that I used to hear growing up was he's one of the good ones as opposed to me being one of the bad ones. So I have to find means to sort of humanize myself um, to other people. And we'll get into some black on black stuff in a second, but most of the time this is dealing with, and not just white people, I have had to ingratiate myself towards Asian people, towards Indian people. Uh, I used to work in a library where I worked with this young woman and her mother was so concerned that I was there working with her because she thought I was going to hurt her. Uh, I actually planned their wedding a couple years ago, which I, <laughs> which is awesome. But, uh, but yeah, and I would walk her to her car at night to make sure she got home safely. But yet there's this fear that, you know, he's, you know, he's just waiting, but, but, but he's also one of the good ones. So you might not have to worry about him. Uh, so there's, there's one angle to that, you know, unique about what I have to do. I have to live in this body and I have to humanize myself. And the flip side is that uh, in a lot of ways, the polar opposite is that behaviors are predicated by uh, your family, 
uh, and your peer groups. You know, if, if your peer group doesn't like black guys, then you're probably not gonna like black guys. Uh, that term down there, quinceanera, it's a party that uh, in the Latin community that a 15 year old girl has when she turns 15. It's like a, a coming out party. Um, I'm from the South, so we call it a cotillion. Uh, <laughs> but a quinceanera, a quinceanera is usually what I observe is when a 15 year old girl, when she turns 15, they have a, like a coming out party. Um, a couple years ago, there was a Latino man in Houston, Texas that um, had a quinceanera for his daughter invited uh, she invited her friends she invited a young black boy who she uh, i believe she had a crush on the dad actually kicked the boy out and beat the daughter that same thing happened to me uh i was invited to a quinceanera when i was about 15 same situation it wasn't that extreme i wasn't kicked out but that following monday because the quinceanera was on a saturday the young girl who was my girlfriend at the time when you're 15 told me she couldn't see me anymore because her dad told her uh that you know if we had mixed babies, those babies would suffer. And like I said, this is like 1991, 92. Um, a couple of years later, I'm working law enforcement. I actually ended up working with her father. And he saw me strapping young man, just got out of the military. And he saw me, he's like, oh, Corey. He's like, oh, thank God you're here. I really want you to date my daughter now. I'm like, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> but uh, he, um, yeah, that, that pressure that she got from her dad was that, some, somehow, some way, black men are bad and dangerous, so just stay away from my daughter. So I had to find a way to humanize myself in his, high, in his eyes uh, years later. Um, also, when we look at black boys and black children, they're seen as less innocent uh, than white children. Uh, I've worked in elementary schools as well, and I've seen, you know, I, I was working there to mentor young black boys. I couldn't half the time because they were in the principal's office or the vice principal's office. And I'm like, well, why are they there? They would do something basically innocuous and would have to go to the principal's office. And yet I would see white students bring weapons to school or one student threw a chair at a teacher. They didn't get to the principal's office, but the young black boys would. So uh, let's just remember this starts at their youth. Uh, this starts at our youth. Uh, I was, like I said, I was one of the good ones. Uh, but even for me, you know, there were times when I would feel like the teacher was picking on, and especially in the South, the teacher was picking on me, uh, and I would be doing absolutely nothing wrong. Um, you know, especially when, you know, as a young boy dealing with police, you know, or if we're accused of the crime, you know, you're a young boy, you have to start dealing with this um, at a lot earlier age than any other group. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but most black mothers, my black, my mother is a black woman, had to have the talk with me when I was about eight or nine. I wasn't even that old, but I remember this vividly. Like she had to sit me down and understand it. Corey, if you're around a cop or even a white authority figure, you have to act a certain way because they could say something about you that could literally get you killed. So, you know, this starts at a young age. I've seen little black boys get in trouble uh for things that don't necessarily need any type of disciplinary action uh children in most societies are considered a distinct group yet black boys are seen as responsible for their actions at an age uh, that young white boys still benefit from the assumption that they're essentially innocent uh, we are never innocent and it happened so quickly i had a, a former friend not former she's still my friend uh, from portland and you know she's white her son is by a black man. So the, the little boy's biracial. And when he was three and four years old, he was cute. As soon as, as soon as he turned 10 in the neighborhood, he was seen as a threat. Now, nothing really happened between the ages of four and 10. Uh, but one day he was playing basketball, and this is in Portland, Oregon. And the cops were called on him because the neighbor thought he was doing something uh, suspicious. Uh, he was playing basketball. And luckily, she had the everything on video. Uh, and confronted the woman about why would you call the cops uh, on this 10 year old boy because that incident, it, it could have ended, the cops could have killed him for some reason if they wanted to. So we don't have the right to be innocent as young boys. And like I said, this starts off at an early age, having that talk with primarily, and not saying, once again, I'm not trying to take anything away from black women, but I know as a young black male, we are taught that at a young age, we have to act a certain way. Um, primarily around white people. Uh, and there is this fear of black men in public spaces. Um, you know, white America 
in America in general, but primarily white America has associated black men with two things, criminality and hypersexuality. So there's this concept of white womanhood in America. And, and I would say in, in certain, I've spent enough time in Canada where, but not as much Canada, I'm, I'm gonna focus on the US, that's my specialty, um, where we have to protect this concept of white womanhood. So if a black man is seen as suspicious or seen as doing something untoward, he is either a criminal or he is trying to rape somebody. Uh, some social science experiments have shown that even trained police officers are biased. That's a given. Uh, I worked in law enforcement. That is a given. That is a massive given. I, I think that is sadly uh, been normalized. Um, and I don't think this is just racism. This is psychological. Uh, that fear that, you know, we have the power to impose on some people. I'm very cognizant of my size. I am a 220 pound semi-muscular, I'm getting softer, <laughs> oh, black male. I am very cognizant of the spaces that I can inhabit. I can go to the coffee shop, I can go to certain places, but I also know that if I am in some spaces that you know, could be seen as you know, working at the library, I'd be at the library uh, late nights and there was a young woman there and um, she was there with me one night and it was late and security would come and locked the library up uh, and they saw us together. And of course they went to her, is everything okay? And she's like, yeah, we, we work together. Everything is fine. He's here at the library with me making sure, and this was a different young woman that I am safe, but security went to her to make sure she was safe from me. So we have to be careful uh, in public spaces because if I do do something uh, that could be seen as a, a threat, once again, uh, my life can be in danger. So, um, so yeah, I think that a lot of black men are quite cognizant of where they're at at all times because we don't want to get caught in a situation where we could be accused of something or, um, yeah, and, and that's just a fact. And I don't think you could probably talk to any black male that isn't cognizant of um, the space that they inhabit and, you know, living in this frame and understanding that even though I am not a threat, that I am seen as a threat. When I go somewhere, I know that people know that I am there because they're going to be cognizant of the black man just in case he might, he might snap. And, and honestly, that's a psychological weight that we have to hold on to. But also I'm thinking to myself, what is that like to be so fearful of this one form so much that you walk around with that fear? And once again, I'm not gonna uh, paint things with a broad brush, but I do think that that fear is, um, inhabits bodies of white people and I know it inhabits the bodies of black people and, and other people. You know, like I said, my friend was a, a young Indian woman. So to, to walk around with that fear of the other is something that I think causes lots of trauma. And I think it manifests its ways and lots of physical damage as well. Um, so let's flip the script a little bit and talk about self-hatred. Um, self-hatred and internalized hatred because of what we've had to go through um, I've seen a lot of black men who basically are obsessed with um, white approval. So because we have been so downtrodden, et cetera, et cetera, if we get white approval, then everything's okay. Now, that's not me, but I understand black men that do that. Uh, there's also this concept of black rejection. Um, I've dealt with that. Um, I, I can't speak for my little sister, but I know she has dealt with that. In a lot of ways, too, there's this, 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 this concept that we have been rejected by certain elements of Black society because I am educated, because I am a veteran, because I've done X, Y, and Z, that some Black people don't, don't want me around. I'm not down. So you kind of live in this alleyway where you have to deal with sort of white approval and then also satiate our Black friends. So you're kind of caught in this space where you have to do this thing known as code switching. You know, when I'm around my black friends, I can act a certain way. When I'm around my white peers, I have to act a certain way. Uh, but I think that sometimes when you, you know, lean either, okay, you're hanging out with the white people, you're being rejected by black people. Oh, you're, you're with the black people, uh, where white society rejects you. So there's, it, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation. Um, and I think that, that self-hatred as well is internalized and it causes a lot of damage. And that comes from a place of trauma. 
Uh, the, the erosion of the black identity is fueled by self-perpetuating legacy of black self-hatred, uh, coupled with an almost pervasive prison culture in which today uh, one out of every four black men will be in prison at some point in their life. Uh, that's true, you know, 25%. And, and I think those numbers actually, it's probably less now. But that what also tells me is that the vast majority of black men, you have nothing to worry about because we're not criminals. We're not going to hurt you. I think that the media plays a huge part in how we're portrayed. We'll talk about that in a second as well. But if the vast majority of the media portrays black people in two ways, um, being a criminal or being an athlete, you know, entertainer is in the middle, but that's how we're portrayed. Um, and also a black man's skin color is irrefutable evidence. Uh, it's a fact it's impossible to hide. Uh, my gender and my skin color, I cannot hide. I am quite unique. I can never uh, assimilate to certain cultures. I can never assimilate to white culture because of who I am. Not saying that it's easier for black women either, but for black men, we can never fully assimilate. We're always going to be assimilate. We're always going to be the other. Um, also, my skin is a weapon, which we've talked about kind of at the last time we spoke. My skin is seen as a weapon. So, <laughs> you, you know, it's almost like a lose lose situation. We can't appease one group and we can't appease the other group so we're kind of stuck in the middle uh when i talk about self-hatred i want to use this example this is sammy sosa i don't know if you guys remember him it's about 20 years ago again i'm aging myself uh he was uh, in a home run derby uh with mark mcguire uh sammy sosa he's dominican from the dominican republic just this strapping uh amazing baseball player he got caught using steroids and, you know, but he was, when he was on his game, he was on his game. Uh, when we talk about this internalized self-hatred, if you look at this picture of this, this, you know, handsome black man, and you look at what he did to himself, he did this thing known as skin bleaching, where, um, you know, they take chemicals and bleach their entire, entire body. Number one, it's really unhealthy to do, uh, and it causes lots of damage. Um, it, it, but it's also psychological. This is this is the epitome of black self-hate. Uh, to do that to your body, it, 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 it's body trauma. Uh, they also, you know, put chemicals in their hair. Uh, they, they do things because they, once again, this is trying to ingratiate, ingratiate yourself to white culture. I don't know, well, I do know what the psychology is because to do that when there's nothing wrong with your skin, uh, which he's admitted there's, there's something psychological to that. And that's not, and I'm not gonna apologize for saying that. Uh, you see it on the flip side too. I've, I've seen a lot of, because I'm trying to listen as much as possible. There's a lot of people in Indian culture that use these skin bleaching cream. So uh, I've seen a lot of Indian actresses uh, come out with uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter, yet they also promote skin bleaching products and they're being called out on it. So it, it's very unhealthy, but it stems from a sort of psychological self-hate to physically do that to yourself. Um, let me move on to black anti-Semitism. If you haven't been watching the news the way I do, uh, I'm a voracious watcher of news and, and pop culture. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was an actor by the name of Nick Cannon. He came out and made these uh, anti-Semitic comments about Jewish people. Uh, I think a lot of this stems from the fact that, especially here in, in America, uh, blacks and Jewish people were kind of arm in arm when it came to the civil rights movement. Uh, a lot of Jewish people and black people work together and they still do. Uh, but I think that this sort of perpetuating where, you know, we've been so, you know, we've had our butts kicked so much that we have to find a way to look down upon uh, somebody else. I think it's a uh, part of the black community that we don't talk about. Uh, I know for me, I've seen, I've seen it in academia. I've seen, you know, black PhDs make some weird and just straight up anti-Semitic comments. My wife is Jewish. And so uh, by no means am I, you know, going to say I'm not sensitive to this. Uh, I've had to call out, I had to call out a professor about two years ago because he made this anti-Semitic comment. And it was based on conspiracy theory. Everything that they have been saying, uh, Nick Cannon, uh, Ice Cube, uh, this this other basketball player, basically he was quoting Hitler and, you know, Hitler didn't like the Jews. He didn't like the blacks either. So you might want to question, 
who you're quoting. Uh, yeah, I've seen this deep vein of anti-Semitism with the with certain uh, black celebrities. Uh, but like I said, I've seen it in academia. And if you don't know who Louis Farrakhan is, Louis Farrakhan is a, a, a black um, a, a black is black Islamist, but he's also an anti-Semite. Just you know, I, I'm at the age now we'll call it as I see it. And with all the stuff going on, if you're going to preach Black Lives Matter, then you can't be anti-Semitic. Uh, even, you know, I, I understand that a lot of Black people felt like white people, were, uh, Jewish people were more accepted because, you know, they can still be white, but this isn't, uh, this isn't helping. Um, so I, I see that a lot of Black men have become, and I'm, and I'm targeting, talking about Black men. I can talk about Black women later, but I'm talking about Black men uh, on these different chat rooms, and you have these guys who are uh, there's this term called hoteps, where they're Pan-Africans. You can be Pan-African without being anti-Semitic. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's a deep vein in, in this, uh, of this that I've seen, uh, and it's been coming out lately, and I'm kind of happy it's coming out, because I think if you're going to, if you're going to be that way, let's talk about it. You, you have to fix that. You can't be anti-Semitic and be pro-Black, or vice versa. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of that going on. I think Nick Cannon, he got fired by Viacom. Uh, what I find funny, Nick Cannon also made a lot of anti-white comments, um, which he didn't get fired for. He got, an, he got fired for the anti-Semitic comments. If I'm not mistaken, Nick Cannon was also married to a woman that was half white. So his children are part white. So you, you can't have it both ways. You can't hate white people and then procreate with a woman that's half white. So um, I, I think that's something that the black community needs to deal with, but deal with it in concert with the Jewish community. Uh, when you look at media portrayals, I've, I've spoken on the statistics. I think 74, 74% of uh, media portrayals of black men either were athletes or criminals. And there's far more to us than that. Um, I think that's been distorted. Um, media consumption negatively affects the public's understanding and attitudes related to black males. Um, and I think it, it, it becomes deadly. Uh, these distorted images and understandings and attitudes towards black males lead to negative real world consequences. Uh, if you've been primed by media your entire life and you've never actually dealt with a black man, you might think certain things about me. And it all breaks down to cultural competency. Um, my family, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, my, my <clears throat> great grandfather, World War II, grandfather, Korean War, uh, uncles, cousins in the military currently. Uh, you know, I, I, my family has a long lineage. Me, I was in the military, I almost forgot. Uh, but if you have a conversation with me, um, you're going to realize I, I love X-Men. <laughs> you know, I like to hike. Uh, a real big fan of sushi. So <clears throat> if you sit me down and have a conversation with me, and I have this ability to be cultural competent, uh, have a cultural competency towards you, then I should expect the same. But we don't teach cultural competency. Um, for most of what we are portrayed as, it's fear-based or it's athletic-based or it's there to entertain. <clears throat> you know, we, we have Black politicians. We have Black business owners. We have Black people that have done amazing things. So I find it odd that the media still portrays us in this negative manner when the vast majority of black men are doing positive things. As far as the positives, the truth is that most black men will not be incarcerated. We are not unemployed. We are not poor. Uh, even though we are more likely to experience these outcomes, the vast majority of us are doing okay. Um, every, and this is me, this is my bubble. My sister has a PhD. I have a cousin who's an Air Force pilot. You know, my, my other cousin that works in IT. Everyone in my circle, my, my, my friend in Portland works in IT. My other friend just moved to Ohio. He, he works in business. So when I see these portrayals, not saying that black men don't do negative things because they do, but so do white people. If I hear that there's been a school shooting in Texas, I'm pretty sure that's not going to be done by a black kid. That's going to be done by a white kid. I also know that George Floyd had a cop put a knee on his neck for nine minutes. And then I don't even want to mention his name. The kid in South Carolina that killed nine black people uh, at a church, uh, they went out and bought him Burger King. So on one instance, you're basically killing a man for 
$20 of ca possibly counterfeit money. On the flip side, you have a, a, a young white man that killed nine innocent black people and they buy him Burger King. Um, if you look at those stats real quick though, uh, the share of black men in poverty has fallen from 41% to 18%. Uh, the most important, the share of black men in middle or upper class as measured by their family income has risen from 38% in 1960 to 57%. So in other words, uh, about one in two black men in America have reached middle class or higher. That's everybody I know. And if you look at certain cities like Houston, Atlanta, Dallas, Austin, uh, Seattle, there it's nothing but positivity when it comes to us, but the media still portrays us in this negative light. Uh, and that point I put at the bottom, if you just imagine if we were humanized and properly integrated into Western society from the get-go, I think many of these issues wouldn't be out here right now. We are still demonized in many ways. So imagine if the flip side happened and we were humanized from the moment we got here in 1619. Oh, that's it. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I'm surprising myself. Um, yeah. So just to wrap up, there's a lot of um, a lot of it's a lot of things that you have to incorporate in this body. Uh, I have to incorporate trauma. I have to incorporate you know the, the the my intelligence, but I'm also having to incorporate the fact that I might scare somebody or that I um, I, I might make someone fearful of myself. Uh, but I think that if you are going to be a humanist and you're going to actually do work as a humanist, then you have to humanize me uh, because I find it easy to humanize others. Um, and like I said, I, I come from a place and I'm not gonna knock the South, but I come from a place where I saw a lot of dehumanization in the church. Uh, I, I, you know, once again, I'm putting out our dirty laundry. Um, you know, a lot of anti LGBTQ messages were going on in the church yet the choir director is gay. Uh, so yeah, there's just uh, a lot of stuff that I think that um, we need to do as far as work as, a, as humanists, even work as myself. Like I, I find it odd that I, going what I've been through, and I'm, I'm still positive, I'm still doing good things, find it so easy to humanize people, but yet I can be dehumanized like that. And that can cost me my life. Um, and, I don't, and, I, and I don't mean that lightly. Uh, there was an incident in Central Park, and I'm about to wrap up, uh, of a, a man that was bird watching and a white woman was there with her dog and the dog shouldn't have been there. And so he videotaped the whole thing and she immediately tried to criminalize him. And, 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 the, and the funny part is he could have pressed charges, but he was benevolent. And, you, you know, on one instance, we're brutes and we're animalistic, but I see a lot of benevolence when it comes to black men because... You know, I, I probably wouldn't have been as nice to her as he was if, because if she would have called the cops and the cops would have shown up, I don't know if they would have drawn their guns, but it, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. I wouldn't be surprised if they might have shot him because he was about to hurt this, um, this woman who was basically lying on him. So, so yeah, I, I wanted to say thanks. That's my spiel. I got tons of them, but uh, if you have any questions right now, I don't have all the answers, but I'm here to kind of answer questions and try to, like I said, I'm primarily a humanist, but um, I also identify with being agnostic. So I will answer whatever questions you have at this point. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Corey. Um, so yeah, as Corey said, we're gonna take a couple of minutes uh, for questions here for those of you who are here on Zoom. And Ian will be um, moderating some questions from Facebook. So we'll be keeping a speakers list. Um, so to get our attention, uh, please hit the raise hand button at the bottom um, and, or by raising your actual hand in the little video um, or leave a comment in the chat. And please, out of respect for everyone who's watching and wants to ask questions, um, keep your questions succinct and under a minute or unfortunately we're gonna have to cut you off. All right, thank you. We can't hear you, Ian. Right, I have an extra mute. It's always great when no one asks a question. It means you must have covered everything so well. Uh, there's no questions on 
the Facebook yet. Oh, I see one question from Ezra. I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, am I unmuted? Great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for um, for your presentation, Corey. One question, you mentioned that sometimes um, some black people reject you because you are educated. Can you explain where that comes from? Why, why is there rejection um, against uh, people that have attained uh, higher education levels? Uh, appearing uh, sometimes in the black community? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, that's something I discuss with my little sister a lot. Um, like I said, I have master's degrees. She has a PhD. Uh, we, first of all, we, we don't look down upon anybody. We've always tried to help, you know, we have a scholarship fund. We're trying to help uh, people, you know, people of color in general. Honestly, if I do the answer to that, Ezra, I think that's a million dollar question. And it's, it's only a small segment of society. I don't think it's the vast majority, but I think that when you, when you see it, like I, I have literally been the smart kid uh, growing up and it's not cool. And there is a, a sort of a, a definite sort of uh, attraction to being a young black person and being cool. Uh, whatever that pertains to, like, is that, you know, there's a lot of culture, a lot of hip hop culture, but being cool. And if you're not cool, you know, having a master's in liberal arts <laughs> and, and all this stuff isn't seen cool by some people. So I think this sort of attraction to being cool uh, and, and, and doing things that are not sadly normal things, like a lot of it has to do with racism. A lot of it has to do with blatant ignorance. I'm someone who taught myself how to surf. I remember being in the army and having black soldiers. I mean, dude, why, why are you surfing? That's not stuff that black people do. Uh, and, and, and so I'm like, look, man, I'm in Hawaii. I'm going to surf because I like, and I'm not a very good swimmer, so I probably shouldn't be out there. But, uh, but yeah, there, there are these sort of schemas out there that there are things that only that white people do and that black people do. And if you are a black person and you do certain things that might be considered white, like skiing or hiking, it's somewhat looked down upon. Now I know that there are plenty of black people that hike and ski and do things of that, but there is this negative stereotype of the, the black man that doesn't have a family or, you know, don't have a father. Uh, and I think it perpetuates itself and it, it's, it's just an unhealthy, uh, an unhealthy stereotype. There's a, a football player uh, named Donovan McNabb and he had a mother and a father. And there was another football player that looked down upon him. Well, you're not a real black man because you had a mom and a dad. And I think that that's something that black people need to fix within our own community. Uh, I think we need to have these discussions and talk about it because I don't know where it comes from. I know, I know where it comes from. It, it comes basically from slavery. You had, um, this once again, dirty laundry, you had black people that worked outside, you had black people that worked in the house. And, and that, that what happened to us, you had house black people and field black people. And if you're seen as a black person that worked inside the house, you weren't really working like we were working outside in the field. So it perpetuates from that. Uh, so if you do attain a little bit of success, uh, it can't be looked down upon amongst ourselves. And I think we have to break those cycles and we have to sort of discuss those stereotypes and realize that, you know, that, that those negative stereotypes don't need to define us, but they still do. Uh, I do everything I can to sort of break those stereotypes, but I think there's still work to be done. Uh, because even to this day, you know, I'm, I'm in my forties, but you know, I can go back home to Rosenberg and still see people that oh, you, you're, you're doing positive stuff. Like why is <laughs> but that seen as a negative? So uh, I don't have the exact answer, but I just know that that's something that, and it's not all black people, and I don't think it's the majority of black people, but it's definitely a certain segment of vocal black people that are out there that see success in other black people, and they see it as a negative, and that's something we need to fix. All right, we have a lineup of questions now. I'll turn it over to <laughs> Dennis. It took one to break the floodgate. <laughs> okay. Hi, Corey. Uh, 
you mentioned that uh, you joined the army or the military, right? So yes. I'm, I'm just curious, why did you join? Is it because of for money or you wanted to help the U.S. government uh, dominate the weaker Ukrainian nations? Uh, I'm going to be honest. The only reason I joined the military is for the uh, educational benefits. Uh, you know, I, it paid for my education. I did three years in the army from 96 to 99 where I lifted weights and surfed. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is pre 9-11. So I joined the military for the, the educational benefits. Uh, a lot of, and, and a lot of black people do join the military for that reason. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of black people that I know is partic particularly join it for the military benefits because, you know, you can go to school without a significant amount of debt. It's the only way for many black people to get out of poverty uh, is to use the military, to use the GI Bill. Um, you know, I used it to get a, a bachelor's, a master's, another master's degree. Uh, in Texas, you can go to any state school for free. So yeah, I used it for the military benefits and it's actually worked out for me. And I know a lot of people of color and not just people of color, but a lot of poor people use the military because of the educational benefits, because of the housing benefits. I could get a home loan uh, for a, a very low percentage rate. So um, was it out of any sense of patriotism? No. And I don't mind saying that. That's just, no, I use it for the educational benefits. And, and, I, and I've seen people use their GI Bill to do positive things. Um, I don't know if the, the Canadian government has the same thing, but uh, on the flip side of that, Dennis, um, you know, I, I know black people that who weren't able to use their benefits because they were black. So, you know, I, I know people that got back, that came back from, uh, you know, Vietnam or, or other conflicts and especially black men, they couldn't use their benefits. That's after World War II, you had a glut of HBCUs, historically black colleges, universities that were created because black men couldn't go to certain schools. But even then, like my grandfather, I think he wanted to be an engineer. They weren't, there wasn't an engineering program at HBCU. So, you know, there were certain avenues that you could go, you could be a teacher, you, you could be a gym teacher, you could do certain things. But so yeah, I've seen the GI Bill and those educational benefits work for, uh, like I said, people of color and poor people. But for me, I use it for the educational benefits. All right, next we'll go to Ulrich. Oh, it's just that, um, well, I am unmuted. <laughs> I got confused with all the messages about who can and can't unmute themselves. Um, I just, uh, th thanks for a, an excellent talk. It was very interesting. Um, your point about uh, being looked down upon because you're, you're educated, I think that's more of a human problem than just a, a, a race problem. Because uh, I, know I had the same sort of experience as a kid. You know, there was a few of us that did really well in school, and then there was a bunch of other guys that were, you know, just sports or whatever. And, uh, you know, basically it wasn't cool. We weren't the cool kids because, you know, we were taking our education seriously and they weren't. Uh, and of course that's manifested now in the States and, and in Canada in sort of a, a widespread disregard for expertise and for, for um, you know, science in general, just, you know, basically uh, people sort of have the idea that their superstitions and conspiracy theories and whatever else are actually uh, better than, than trying to find out what's really going on in the world. I'm so sorry, um, Margaret, would you mind, um, just for the sake of time for everyone, uh, focusing on a question? Yeah, well, my question was going to be, uh, what do you think of the, um, the White Fragility, the book and the concept? Um, as far as the book, I. I ordered it a couple of weeks ago. I haven't read it yet. I've seen, um, I believe her, her name is D'Angelo. I've seen her give a couple of interviews. As far as the concept, uh, as someone who was taught in the classroom at two uh, predominantly white institutes, I'm going to say it does exist because this conversation that I've had today, I have made people cry, uh, not trying to make them cry, but I was, I, I remember teaching race and ethnicity a couple of years ago and Teaching in uh, Portland, Oregon, I'm teaching students who were taught to be colorblind to race, uh, which doesn't help. Uh, if you're colorblind to the fact that you're not doing yourself or myself any, any favors. Uh, so I, I know that when I discuss certain topics, when I would discuss um, indigenous people, when I would discuss uh, you know, this concept of white privilege, it didn't sit well with some people. And I'm a big fan of bell hooks. So if you're sitting in the classroom in front of me and you start crying, I'm going to keep teaching because I don't have time to sort of 
soothe you and, and, and wipe away your pain because I think that's the attention that this uh, certain person wanted. So I think that I know the concept exists, with, but that doesn't mean it's a negative. I think that if we're going to have these tough conversations, that's a positive. Uh, but also when you're dealing in a classroom, like with me, I'm dealing with students, so I have to also be careful. Uh, I don't want to cause any damage, but I also am coming from a place of learning. Like if, I, if you're going to take a class in race and ethnicity, I'm going to teach a class <laughs> in race and ethnicity. And that's not always going to be a nice thing. If I teach a class in race and crime, I have to teach a class that has to do with race and crime. So um, I think what I've seen with a lot of youth is that they, they think they know the answers, but when you hit them with facts and data, and this is what happened to Native Americans, this is what happened to Latino people, they don't want to deal with it. And so sometimes they're quite fragile about it. Um, what the sad part is, when you mentioned the whole intellect, uh, anti-intellectual thing, I've seen that in adults where they know what's going on uh, and they still don't want to do it. And so they'll become fragile. That incident in Central Park, that was the very definition of white fragility. This is a black man telling her to put her dog away. She didn't want him to say that. So she started crying and I'm going to call the cops. So I think it's a real concept, but I also think we can, we can fix it. I think we can work on it and try to, I don't mind working with people uh, to try to help them as far as this work that I do when it comes to racial trauma. All right. I'll go to Heather now. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Corey. That's been great so far. Um, I just wanted to um, ask about, um, I'll start with um, having seen Tarana Burke, who is the uh, founder of the Me Too movement, um, spoke in Kelowna a couple of years ago. It was fantastic. And um, she did a really great job of researching the British Columbia and what the um, minority women might experience in um, in the city in which she spoke, which was great. So she could speak to that directly. So um, one of the audience members, a white woman, asked her what, because she did speak specifically to black women and Aboriginal women and, you know, what they have to deal with and going missing and all those sorts of things. So the question from the white woman in the audience was, what can we do as white women to, you know, to help somehow what can we do and the answer was to allow to give black and aboriginal women a platform to speak for themselves do not speak for them so i just wanted to bring that up and ask if you could expand or elaborate on that or perhaps another angle on that um thank you for your for your comment and i i agree with her uh if you look at i don't know if you guys are looking at what's going on in portland right now uh like i said i spent six years in portland uh Portland, there was a Black Lives Matter movement. And what has happened over the past several days seems to be like other movements have sort of conflated. Um, Occupy Portland, uh, moms demand action. And so basically white voices have shut down black voices and that doesn't help. And then from what I understand, um, they decided moms demand action decided to create a 501 ck and not work with black people and go and let's make money off of this and that just doesn't help so i, I think being able as an ally try like like ian came to me and gave me a platform to do this uh and i appreciate that uh but i think being an ally is all about giving that platform but also realizing that i see white people as allies i'm married to a white woman so i'm not <laughs> No, I don't really, I see everybody as an ally. So yeah, I, I think that allyship works best when you can have these conversations and also realize that I might say something that could offend you, but I'm not doing it out, out of a place of anger or pain. Like I'm trying to get my point across. My, my experience as a black man is totally different than my wife's experience as a white woman. That doesn't mean I cannot understand her and vice versa. Uh, but also be in a place where I can listen. And like, like, like she said, like being able to give platforms, because if you have that space to give a person of color a platform and you're there to listen and, and be an ally, I think that's where we're at. And I think if you're not doing that, then you're detrimental to the cause. All right. I think we have two more questions on the deck. Next up is JB and we'll see if I think we can still finish by six. Uh, go ahead, Hello. JB. Thank you. 
see if I can get a video going here as well. Um, yeah, uh, it's a tremendous uh, talk. I really have given me a lot to think about. And just one thing I wonder if you could expand a little bit on, um, you said, you know, uh, um, as a black man, you, you need you know, people in other positions of more privilege to humanize you. And I, I love that. I love seeing humanism as something that can be more of a verb and not, you know, a list of doctrines. Could you just expand on that, kind of what you think the task of, of humanizing uh, looks like? Hey, first of all, thanks for, your, uh, thanks for your question. As far as I'm concerned, for me, it's sort of natural because I come from a place of trauma and pain where I have been so dehumanized. So I refuse to do that to someone else, uh, whether it's a person that might be literally homeless 10 feet away from me in Seattle, uh, or whether it's a, that's always been my spirit. Um, that's why when I was 12, I was like, hmm, there's something wrong with this religion stuff. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's, just, that's just where I come from uh, as a humanist. But if I'm talking to a white person, uh, just like Heather said, by being able to give me a platform and by listening to me, I can't make a white person not be afraid of me. I cannot make a white person uh, humanize me or an Asian person or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I can have my voice out there and, and try to keep doing what I'm doing to let people realize that number one, I think the media has done a masterful job of dehumanizing us. I think the criminal justice system has done, there's nothing wrong with the criminal justice system in the United States of America. It does exactly what it's supposed to do is incarcerate poor people in black and brown bodies. So I can't make a person humanize me. What I can do is keep doing the work and working with people. Like you said, you have a lot to think about. That's awesome. That tells me that you're already doing the work, but I cannot make someone see me as a human being. And I'm at the age now where I don't even really care. Like if, you know, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm just at a certain point where I don't, I shouldn't have to, but I also understand that I, I have had to do that. I have had to basically, you know, I'm very jovial. I'm very disengaging, you know, but I'm also someone like I shouldn't have to force my humanism upon you. If you have that issue, then that's something that I think um, people have to deal with. And I think there's racial trauma. White people have racial trauma too. I think that if you look at the history of what certain people have done to other peoples, I think that people have to reckon, reconcile with that. If you look at what's going on now with the upheaval in, in America right now, and even certain parts of Canada, there's, if you don't reconcile that properly, it's going to keep happening. And if you're cool with that, you're cool with that. But if not, if you really want to fix the issues, then you need to reconcile with some of the things that have been, which we won't get into, but some of the things that have been done to different people in different bodies. All right, I saw one more hand add to there. How are you on time, Corey? I'm good, I'm good, okay. uh, yeah, just, just. All right, we'll take Rana and then Murray and I think we'll call it there. So Rana, you're up and you should be unmuted. Thank you, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you, Corey, for, your, for everything you shared, for your, the stories you shared and your experience. Uh, I think JB kind of uh, covered my question, but I just want to like, phrase it in my way, I, I, I would say. Um, I love the fact that you were saying, um, like I love to hear it, but I don't, I don't love the fact that you have to do this every day on your, like as an individual to, um, you said that you're, it's easy, it's easy for you to humanize everyone else uh, around you when you go and interact with other folks. You're, it's easy for you to, uh, to humanize others. What advice would you give to 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 us for now? Um, to like like a simple trick when we interact with others, we all have our own biases. We have our mm. fear. We have like when we meet other folks. Uh, what that little trick you have it you do like you play it in your in your brain mm. that you can you can easily simply start to see the other person as a human, not like, like, gotcha. yeah. Thank uh, you. No, no, thank you. I think it also comes from, like I said, I, I come from a family that dealt with a lot of trauma. And so the things that my great grandmother did to my mother, I mean, that, that trauma is generational. You just don't get rid of that stuff overnight. So for me, the last thing I would want to do, because I've been dehumanized for big chunks of my life, 
the last thing I would want to do is do that to someone else. I had to try to, part of it's natural. I was raised by a, a, a five foot two inch black woman from Richmond, Texas, <laughs> who, uh, uh, who would basically taught me to love everybody. And so even though I was raised in the church, there are certain things that I learned in the church. Like I, certain things I learned that I wish the church would live by, <laughs> but they don't. So uh, I think ultimately I live by two rules, love everybody and help the poor. And that's pretty much it. There's no caveats to that. It's just love everybody and help the poor. And I think that was given to me by my mom. Uh, and my sister's the same way. That doesn't mean I won't critique you. That doesn't mean I won't be, get angry with you. That's another thing I want to discuss is, um, you know, it, it, being in this body, I can't get angry. You know, if I get angry, that, that's a, that could be a death sentence. So I know for me, it was taught, but it's also natural. You know, I, I grew up in a place where I could, I could possibly be homophobic. I grew up, I worked in a law enforcement agency where I would see racism every day. I also naturally reject that. Um, I reject it and that's natural. And part of it is also learned experience. Having traveled so much, you know, having been stationed in Hawaii, having, you know, been to different places, ha having traveled, you get to see human beings as human beings. Uh, and also being in this body, it could be beneficial too. Being a large black man with superhuman strength, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't true, but I mean, it can be seen, uh, there, there are some positives as well. So uh, like I said, a lot of it is learned, a lot of it is natural. And, and I give a lot of credit to my mom. She just taught me to treat everybody as human beings. All right, and for the last question, we'll go to uh, Murray. Good evening, uh, nice to have you back. Um, you've referenced this and I, I, was just, I, I was just doing some research and I came across a big study by the Brookings Institute and you've mentioned this, and, and obviously one of the things was, and they even mentioned some of the stories you talked about, where black communities had built themselves, basically had, had built themselves up by the capitalist ethos by pulling themselves by, by the bootstraps, and then, of course, had not been given the opportunity to continue. And what, what, what they were showing in there, in, in that Brookings Institute, is that, is that, the, is that the statistics are quite, are, are quite startling. If you look at uh, average net worth between individuals, between white, and black, and Hispanic, it's like 180,000 to 18,000. You look at families, it's 900,000 to 130,000. And I guess my question to you is, is that even though governments have now piled on you know, deficits or whatever, it just seems that, and you had mentioned, if we don't deal with this, it, 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 it just seems to me that we need public policies, just like we need public policies to address the prevailing income inequality. We need public policies to address for people to get resources so they can participate in the economy. Because without that, we, we're, we're just going to keep re, revisiting this. And no, I yeah, and so that's my question. As as difficult as as uh, you know, public uh, financing is for governments, we need to address that. No, and I, and you're exactly right. And uh, thank you because I remember you you mentioned that last time. As far as I'm concerned, when you say public policy, uh, one of the big things that I'm concerned with is this concept that shouldn't be too controversial, but the concept of reparations. Uh, different groups have receive reparations for things that happen to them. So if you basically take everything away from us and you, 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 you put black people in this place uh, where everybody else has had a head start or, and then you expect them, like you said, like we, we've still found a way, even though we have been, you know, given disadvantages, we still found a way to kind of maneuver through that. That should tell you that if we were ever integrated in society properly, then a lot of the issues would go away. So as far as I'm concerned, reparations should be on the table. I believe a city in North Carolina just decided to give reparations. Now, how are reparations going to work? It's a massive undertaking, but if, you, if damage was caused, then damage can be fixed. So I'm a big fan of reparations, and I know that for some people that's controversial. Why should we give... Uh, X, Y, and Z money because my ancestors were basically, their backs were broken to create the economy that America lives off today. 
And if you see it that way, which is factual, then pay us for that work that was done. My ancestors are dead. They're never going to be able to reap that benefits. So we should be able to, to have a talk about reparations and it needs to be done properly. Um, I don't believe in giving a check. My sister's a big influence. Give us free education. Find a way to fix the damage that was caused. And I think it needs to be in a way, it needs to be monetary, but it also needs to be in a way to where we can advance ourselves in, in, in an educational way because student debt is a massive issue uh, in the States right now. So uh, yeah, I think that reparations needs to be discussed, but I don't think that where we're at right now as a country, it's gonna happen. All right, well, I think that's it, if that's all the questions. Thank you, Corey, first of all, so much for your presentation today. We all really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and talking so much about your experiences and about um, like the experiences of black male men in uh, society. Um, and yeah, so everyone, um, as Ian has said in the chat, uh, our next event is going to be on August 13th. Um, and it is member exclusive, but it is about the importance of science in public policy um, and how governments use science to create public policy. Um, and if you like this event and uh, want to help us create more events like this, don't forget to contribute to our summer fun drive and the link is in the chat. Um, yeah, thank you so much again to Corey and everyone for joining us. Um, and yeah, that's today's event. Thank you guys.